What is life like for the men sentenced to hard time here? Depression in here and, and loneliness, it's just, it, it eats you up. There's an urban legend or myth out there that somehow they're luxurious. There is no luxury in these prisons. I promise you there's no luxury, and, and no one's advocating that there should be. There's very few programs, very few things to do. Even as somebody who works there, there's that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness, and it's just like these people are locked away. I know a lot of guys like me, you get to start feeling like, you know, you're alone, that you're dealing with this by yourself. And uh, that's not a good feeling to be alone, especially when you're struggling for survival, struggling to get your life back. Hey, we love to lock up people and throw away the key, even nonviolent offenders. The state's recidivism rate is 33%. That means about a third of prisoners who get out in Alabama will reoffend. A lack of resources creates a vicious cycle. The overcrowding and the understaffing oftentimes works against us in being able to rehabilitate our inmates, which has the double impact of keeping our recidivism rate high because they don't leave prepared to be successful in society. 98% of all prisoners in Alabama will get out, and 90% will get out just within a few years. So the question is, what are you going to do with the people while they're in prison to reduce the chance that they're going to re-offend? Uh, we're trying to change our culture of the way society sees uh, uh, pri prison or the penitentiary. Um, it's not all bad. There are a lot of positive things going on inside the institutions. One positive thing has been going on at Donaldson since 1988. Every other week, a different faculty or staff member from UAB steps out of the world of academia into no. this. It shows most of the metal. Volunteers providing a one-time academic lecture on any topic that they're passionate about, and their students are prisoners. We've learned about agriculture, we've learned about um, physical health, we've learned about mental health. The Greeks, the Romans, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance. Education in Africa that predated Kunta Kinte. The people from the medical center would talk about some strange disease. Biologists and chemists would talk about quite technical things. Um, we just had a lecture out there on cave exploration that they love, or nutrition, or new advances in brain chemistry. Socrates, uh, uh, just uh, books, Plato books, I wouldn't even pick up. The prisoners who attend get no academic credit. This is simply an opportunity to learn. We're not trying to go in and change their lives. We're not trying to go in and lecture them about how to be nicer or... <laughs> um, this is really just intellectual enrichment, to give them something to think about, to give them a couple of hours to step out of their ordinary lives. It keeps you alive, all right? We first met this man in 2014. My name is Ronald McKeithen. I'm in here for first degree robbery, been locked up over 33 years. Ronald McKeithen was convicted of several crimes in the 1980s, burglary, fraudulent use of a credit card, and robbery. Under Alabama's Habitual Offender Act, he's serving life without parole. The lesser of two evils, I guess. He's a regular Everybody. at the lectures. What I like about this lecture, the UAB lecture series, you got professors coming up here, and they're so passionate about sharing what they know. And uh, I mean, for a while, I, I mean, that's my visit. You know, I don't get visits anymore that, that much. So, and these people come to visit me, that's how I look at it. You have to do things to direct your mind in a constructive, positive way. And, um, and a lot of guys want to change, and to change you need options. And this lecture's here, they, they give you options. This rare opportunity is also reason for prisoners to behave. There is a selection process on who gets to attend. We put the information about classes out in our daily inmate newsletter, and from that point we get request slips in from the inmates, and we'll kind of go through a selection process, looking at a variety of things, mainly disciplinary history, if an inmate has Recent, recently been in trouble. We normally uh, 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 select someone else. How many requests do y'all get? It, it hundreds. We get hundreds of requests. 20 to 25 men go to each lecture. 
but with a population of 1,500, that represents only 1.6% of the prisoners at Donaldson. Still, for those who are chosen, it's a coveted chance to interact with the outside world. My name is Gary Smith. I went ahead and, and volunteered, and um, uh, it, was, it changed my life. Theater professor Dennis McLernan first lectured in 2007. And I brought no materials with me because, you know, I was going to work with everybody on their feet. And the, the one thing that started going through my mind was, what am I going to say to these men? And uh, just a voice inside of my head said, just tell them the truth. And that was, from then on, I was at peace with it. How are they different from the students that you teach at UAB? You know what? They're not different at all. They're not different at all. So, you may see these men and think, why should I care? Why does it matter to me if they're educated and rehabilitated? Here's why. Research shows programs like this make prisons and the public safer. Prisoners who participate in educational programs are 43% less likely to commit another crime. They, they have a total change of attitude. They're a lot less disruptive. Even when they leave the class, uh, they can go back to the dormitory, spread that knowledge to the other inmates, um, and it just helps the institution as a whole when they, when they do that. I don't see a, a downside. I wish that we could uh, provide it for, for more inmates at one time than, than we currently do. Programs work, they really do. Uh, the, the only shame is we just don't have more of them. A lot of, of, of these these men come from uh, disadvantaged uh, homes or communities, uh, a lot of them with low socioeconomic status and, and environments. Um, I hear and see a lot of talk of uh, abuse uh, from their own families. We've got to start with providing them as much knowledge and rehabilitation and opportunity as possible because it's not just about them. It's about those people and those families and, and those children that are attached to them. So it's a bigger picture.